But believe it or not, St. Pete does get a lot of cases. So, really? yeah, they um, they have a case um, that I worked where it was a, a head on the side of the road. Just um, a head. Yeah. And so I did the analysis and um, he's been identified. They don't know how he died. Um, but this is the rest of a jogger pass? found it. No. This is 56, a Pinellas County Sheriff's Office podcast. I'm Ricky Butler with Laura Sullivan and Ashley Cooley. We have another great show on deck for you today. Uh, always doing our best to diversify who we're chatting with in the agency. And we're going back into the civilian world today with Dr. Meredith Tice, who is our Forensic Quality Assurance Coordinator. But she has a really cool background beyond that. Not that that's not cool, uh, but she is a doctor of forensic anthropology and really has a unique path uh, getting to the sheriff's office. Now, for some context for everyone, because we already said, like, her background is so cool, we're going to probably spend less time talking about what she actually does versus what she's done. But uh, so the sheriff's office is there's so there's 3,080 sheriff's offices in the US. Um, and about 1% of those have the cr- triple crown of accreditation, which is uh, accreditation in law enforcement, corrections, and corrections healthcare. So we've had that since, I think, the mid-'80s. Uh, but back in around 2017, the sheriff decided he wanted to pursue a accreditation in forensic science, and we needed someone uh, to lead that process and kind of be the, um, I guess, just the point person, making sure and, and being that point of contact for the accrediting agency. Thus, Dr. Tice's position was created. And I'm not going to call her Dr. Tice the whole time. I'm going to call her Meredith, but I'm just trying to be formal on the front and before everything goes off the rails. So uh, Meredith has been with us uh, since 2017, I believe, uh, and we're excited to have her on 56 to talk about what she does, but her background is probably one of the coolest backgrounds of all the people we have here, but we're nerds because we like all this stuff, so mm-hmm. we'll see if that translates to We get to talk else. about dead things dead and things. bones. Yep, <laughs> yes. bones, all the things Laura likes. Uh, <laughs> that's but, not, that's not, I like a few other things, too. That's yeah, not all the things I like. Stop. Uh, so before <laughs> we get into it, Ashley has a question for us to kind of level the playing field. I do. Make us uncomfortable, Ashley. All right. That was the plan. All right, so this is a thinker. Mm. Would you like to be a mortal on an immortal planet or immortal on a mortal planet? It's kind of a little nerdy question. Too. Can you use it in a sentence? Um, hold on. Um, so mortal means that you can die. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, is, what is an immortal planet? Like uh, an immortal world. Like imagine that you, I would just imagine that Robots. everybody else on this world right mm-hmm. now is immortal except for except you. Except for me. Yeah. So it's it's in terms of you will die, no one else will, or you uh, or you won't perish, but everyone else will. So, so basically, I mean, do I want to be lonely? Yeah, I'm I'm an egoist, and I can't think too far ahead as far as future sadness. So I'm going to be immortal. Mm. See what happens. <laughs> I mean, eventually, do yeah. wait, am I going to be alive like after the sun goes supernova and everything? Am I just going to be floating out in space, still alive? Whatever you want the question to be, Laura, it's just whether or not you die. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're immortal, I whatever you overthink. think will happen, yes. Okay. I'll, why? The, I, I'm not going to pass on immortality. I'll take it. Hmm. Hmm. I thought it was kind of tough. No, it is. I'm think, it's, it is a thinker. Mm-hmm. I think I'd rather die. Yeah. Think about that episode of the Twilight Zone where mm-hmm. the guy that loved books, uh, the nuclear holocaust happened or something. Everything blew up and he came out and he broke his glasses, even though he had all this time in the world. I think mm-hmm. it was called like all the time in the world. And that was just terrifying to me when I saw that. It's just him. I don't want to be by myself. Yeah. So I think I'd rather die. There you go. We get to like be young and look good or look as good <laughs> as we do now, right? Whatever you want it to be, <laughs> okay. Laura. Okay, just... Like you're you immortal, go. so St- you're not. You're not, you're not really going to age. You know nothing. You're not going to okay. decay in any kind of way. Can we get way. better? Like if, if I wanted like. to lose twenty pounds, or am I just stuck like this forever now? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Meredith. <laughs> I would probably say mortal as well. Yeah, so that I don't see everyone I love dying, mm. and then I didn't be think alone. about that. I was just being selfish. <laughs> That's a good point too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. I'm, uh, the idea of living forever is kind of terrifying to me. Yeah. It's a little scary. I will mourn you all when you're gone. 
Thank you. Yeah. For thousands and thousands yeah. of years. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate that. As she's getting fit, as you know yeah. what. And yeah. <laughs> Laura's just enjoying, you know, getting burnt while the sun burns up and we're all Doing gone. Doing jujitsu all by yourself. It's an experience. <laughs> what are you going to put in a hold? Uh, yeah. All My right. memories. That was. Uh, there you go. There you go. That was a deep. That was. Yeah. That was. That's I, tough. I didn't even understand the question the first time. I, I know. I had to give you a definition. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, I knew what it meant. I was just <laughs> trying to buy time so I could comprehend it. No, no. I get it. All right. Forensic, it? forensic Quality Assurance Coordinator, Mary Tice. Welcome to 56. Um, Thank you. How, uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up just north of Atlanta in Cumming, Georgia. Okay. So my parents still live up there. So, and then high school, born and raised up there, everything? Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're, we're always into science. Did that come later? What happened? Um, yeah, I would say always. I preferred science when I came to school um, and even all the way up to high school. I know we'll kind of get into it, but I um, started thinking about forensic science in high school and actually interned at a funeral home to mm. kind of get my foot in the door of a coroner's office there. Mm. Um, so wait a minute, because I want to talk about that. I probably don't want to talk about it, but we're going to anyway. Okay. Was there like an aha moment for you when you're like, did something happen where you're like, ooh, science or... No, no, this was there. That's all right. (laughs) Yeah. It's curious. All right. So uh, in high school working at a funeral home, what did you? I was. So in Georgia, um, they have the coroner system. Mm -hmm. So each county has an elected coroner. And then the medical examiners actually primarily run out of Atlanta at the Georgia investigation. So the county coroner at the time owned a funeral home. That's convenient. So yeah. So I did an internship there and was able to go out to scenes with them and um, get my foot in the door to see if that was kind of an area I wanted to go in. See, that um, would, to me, when I, when you said that, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm interested in forensics. Oh, I'm going to go intern at a, you know, at a funeral home. Yeah. Like that just doesn't seem to. I probably going into, I didn't realize how much funeral home stuff I would assist with. Mm-hmm. So I did help with like <laughs> visitations and like welcoming families, but then I would also help in the back as far as Dressing, washing, embalming, oh. um, assisting. You put makeup on dead people? Yes. Wow. Um, put lip filler in. Oh, and the little eye cap things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Other things probably shouldn't talk about. No, we should. Oh. Mm. oh yeah, we, Ricky. Mm. No, we, no, we can. We can, we, we, can okay. cut, we can cut it out. So, um, oh, <laughs> so probably one of the the weirdest things that you don't realize. So when you die, your mouth opens so they don't want the mouth to open during visitation. So they actually have these like nail, like screw type things that you put in the top and bottom of the jaw and use wire to twist it to hold it together throughout the visitation. Wow. So I would do that. And You also like, don't the eyelids get sewed shut or no? No, no. you put these like I know there's bumpy a cap. discs the caps, over yeah. and the cap is supposed to hold the oh, eye closed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. It's got like ridges on it, I think. And it oh, exactly. Yeah. So it catches. Mm. I'm, I know more than I thought about that. I yeah. Where that came good from. job. Um, so you got to get right in there, like putting screws in there, the mouths I of did, dead people. Yeah. And that, so I was always. Was it weird at first? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I would hope it was weird at first. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. She's like, awesome. I'm always... But so the expectation going in, though, as a high school, are, are you like a senior in high school? Like, yeah. I okay. Was. So your expectation going in, interning at the funeral home, did you expect that you would be? I honestly did not know I would be participating in that aspect so, of it. So it was like, hey, do you want to come in the back? And yeah. I mean, you're there. <laughs> I can't remember how often I was there. Um, Probably like one day a week or so. Mm. So if there's no calls for the coroner, then I didn't have anything else to do. So so in a coroner system, they would go out to crime scene bodies also? Yes. Just like our medical examiner So would. pretty much every death they uh. go out to, unless a doctor is signing off. Um, mm-hmm. But if there's any question, they go to it and they relay the information on the death to the medical examiner. And the medical examiner determines if an autopsy is going to be conducted. Okay. And then, so like in that system... They happen at the medical examiner's office then, like the autopsy. So like when yes. the it, it would be sent to Atlanta if correct. Okay. Yeah. Everything goes to Atlanta. There's I think another office in Savannah okay. and maybe one in like South Georgia. Okay. And this was I don't know currently, but this was at the time at the when time. I was there. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I, I always thought it'd be date. cool to work on like a coroner campaign. You could have so much fun with the materials. And- oh, yeah. yeah. Can you imagine the I campaign I had no slogans? idea that that was wow. like an elected oh, yeah. role. Yeah. No, it would be. You only have to have a high school diploma, and then you get training 
Um, but yeah, it's an elected position. Well, well, so you're telling me I can come straight out of high yep. school you and run for corner. I would huh? like to be the corner, but I know nothing. Mm-hmm. Does that happen? People win? Probably in some of the... In some of the counties. Yeah. yeah where it's like... <laughs> no one's running against it's you. It's like the and... coroner's office, you know, hair care, and tire center in downtown. Like, that's all there is. <laughs> <laughs> Those like, small little towns. Man. I wonder if you have to prove that you have, like, your own space for the bodies, or does it come with its, a place? I'm sure there's a place. <laughs> well, no, because they, they <laughs> well, were well, a funeral home, so they already had a place. I got a I think if they you had could use, like, a, the local hospital, potentially. Okay. You could use that okay. cooler. Basically, you're holding it until the medical examiner... Comes okay. for transport. I got we one have of our them, future career plans. Now. I got one of them big Yetis, <laughs> <laughs> but the aftermarket one from Walmart. That may show up on the news. <laughs> oh. Ozark trade. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, <clears throat> that's awesome. Yeah, it's a totally different world. But so anyway, so yeah. um, so I was like, all right. So you remember? Obviously, had you seen a dead body up until that point in your life? No. Okay. So how was that? Like, oh, um, I like this. I didn't necessarily say that I liked it, right. but I didn't mind it. So we do, even here, we get some people that are hired into crime scene and then they've never seen a dead body and they go to those scenes and they're like, oh, I can't do this. So at least it yeah. opened that door and allowed me to experience that. Um, but it also taught you to separate the person from mm-hmm. what you're seeing. Right. So you don't, you have to kind of separate it and don't think about them as a person with family, although it is hard at a funeral home. Sure, sure. All right. So then what? So I went to college. Um, I got my undergrad from the University of Georgia, and then I moved to Texas, to Texas State University. Um, While I was there, we opened um, the second body farm in the United States, so they called it the Body Ranch. Because it's Texas, Texas. of course. Exactly. Were there big bodies there? Um, Everything's big in Texas, no. Long, Longhorn, but no. No, but <laughs> they all had a star uh-huh. tattooed on them. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeehaw. So uh, around, <laughs> around the U.S., uh-huh. more and more have popped up mm-hmm. since then. But basically, they are wanting to create these facilities to look at decomposition patterns, um, like what the process is when someone decomposes in different environments and different conditions. Um, and that's what a body farm essentially yes. is. So the first one was in uh, Tennessee uh-huh. at University of Tex- uh, University yeah. of Tennessee in Knoxville. And, and you were there for a while, right? I was, yeah, yeah um, as an undergrad. And then um, we opened the second one. So if, for example, here, if someone dies and we want to know how long they've been dead, you can't compare the data from Tennessee or Mm -hmm. Texas because it's very different. Right. So uh, throughout the U.S., we're hoping to kind of have more for that type of knowledge. What's the process for donating your body to a a body farm? So those body farms... Asking for a friend. (laughs) (laughs) Someone has to specifically donate their body to that facility. Uh So if you're just to donate your body to medicine, it goes usually to the anatomical review board for that state, and then it goes to medical schools usually. So the body farms, you donate your body to that facility and you fill out this huge packet of all of your medical history, um, where you've lived, um, hobbies, things like that. So they can basically use your body for the decomposition research, but then your skeleton goes into a skeletal collection and is basically used forever for skeletal research. So when I was in Texas, for example, we had an older female Um, I think she was in her 80s or 90s, and she had basically played on a bowling league. So for years and years, she she bowled with her friends. Um, And her right arm was so arthritic, you could see evidence of her using that arm so much more than her left arm, which is most likely because of that bowling. Mm -hmm. But we ask questions like that so we can see how it might affect the skeleton. How would that affect the skeleton? Like arthritis is just like inflammation. longer than the other one. Well, I mean, like, is it the bones are thinner or? So arthritis in your bones, um, basically your joints are joined together by cartilage. Mm -hmm. And when you are constantly moving those joints, the cartilage wears wears away and it's basically bone on bone wear. So the bone ends up reshaping itself. Mm. Um, so you can see that in those joints. So athletes, gotcha. for example, um, in their knees, you can see arthritis. Um, can you imagine some early. of the damage you'd see on skeletons of like the canine unit or Oof. some of those oh, guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
We'll have it's to get one on of them bones. to donate their body. Definitely. Science. That would be Start cool. Start working on it. <laughs> Do we have a body farm here in Florida? There is one in Pasco County. Okay. They, okay. Yeah. So I haven't been involved in that one. Can we go on a field trip, Ricky? For science. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, um, let's go. <laughs> what, but that one hasn't started yet. Or they, Are there any bodies there? Um, I know there used to be. I think they're kind of in transition right now. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure currently. All right. So let me just back up because we went off the rails really quick there. What did you? What were you in undergrad for? Uh, anthropology. Okay. So th- no deviation. We went right into forensic anthropology. And I, I, is it I just initi- anthropology or forensic anthropology? At this, so this point? Oh, I initially wanted to become a forensic pathologist mm-hmm. to do autopsies. And I took an undergraduate class. Um, in cultural anthropology and loved it mm-hmm. and actually started volunteering at the University of Tennessee Body Farm uh, and fell in love with it. So I switched to anthropology. So while it was focused in forensics, my degree is in anthropology okay. for undergrad. And, then, and just to clarify, so a foren- define a forensic pathologist. They're like the medical examiner? They're, yes. They're so forensic a pathologist doctor. is a medical doctor. You go to medical oh. school and you're looking at the soft tissues of the body versus okay. forensic anthropology, you're looking at the skeletal system, so the hard tissues of the body. Hmm. All right, so Texas, you go to Texas, mm-hmm. and then you transferred there, or was that for your That ma- was for my master's, for your master's. and okay. I got my master's in anthropology with a focus in forensic anthropology. Okay. But it was really the body farm that kind of diverted you there, or was that just a, a, no, cho- a chance? No, so for a lot of the forensic sciences, when you get a master's, you basically have to find a professor to work under. So okay. if the professor's not taking students, then you can't go there. So I found a professor that I really liked. I went and met her. And she was taking new students. So okay. I went and worked with her. Cool. This might be a dumb question, but what's the difference between anthropology and forensic anthropology? Other than obviously forensic, but an- anthropology is bones. So anthropology <laughs> is the study of humans. <laughs> okay. So, and that could encompass oh, language, okay. culture, history through archaeology, okay. and then you have biological anthropology. And okay. then a subfield of biological anthropology is forensics. forensics. Okay. okay. Got it. All right. So... After Texas, then what? So after Texas, I applied to the University of South Florida, and that's what brought me down to Tampa. Um, Again, there was a professor there that was taking PhD students. Um, So I started a doctoral program at the University of South Florida, um, and I worked there at USF and got my PhD in forensic anthropology. How long did that take? That's a lot of school. I mean, you were in school for like, what, 30 years? I felt <laughs> like it. Yeah. It's complicated. So total college years is 10. Wow. Okay. That's not bad. So no, it was actually pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like summers in between, I worked at different places to get more experience in different areas of anthropology and mm-hmm. forensics. Um, so. And as I would imagine in those programs, especially when you're getting a master's and doctor, I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities to... Like they're there. I'm, I'm sure like at USF, for example, I mean, I know you worked under that professor and you guys went out and, and did all kinds of stuff. So let's get into that uh, because that's the really cool stuff. So talk about some of the um, some of the things that you worked on. So through, those years. through as a student, I was an intern at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. There was a forensic anthropologist full time there while I was um, at the University of Georgia. So I did that. Um, I also did internship at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. They have a huge human skeletal collection of known individuals there um, in Washington, D.C. And they are from the earlier 1900s, but we have all their information so you can do research Mm. there with that skeletal collection. Um, So just just continuing to gather more information based on... Yes. So my purpose there was just to basically... I was an intern for a summer, so I... um, collected skeletal measurements from the skeletons there. They also had some skeletons from a local cemetery. They were historic um, where someone had broken into the vault Mm. and jumbled all the skeletons. So our goal was to try to identify the, um, like the father, the mother, and then there were a couple other family members from this historic vault. Um, So, and I think it was the father that actually died from being run over by a carriage um, so that was wow. really cool to see like the trauma, um, cause um, you don't have that today. No. Um, right. so working Unless you're with not Amish territory, maybe. Oh, possibly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh no, Seamus. <laughs> 
It might come in useful someday. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> it was really cool, though, to be there with historic stuff. Hmm. Um, and then I also did an internship at the Natural Museum of um, Health and Medicine. Hmm. Um, and that's, um, there's a lot of, like, old cases, like um, the, oh, I'm not going to remember. Um, like, some of the presidents that have um, died, like Lincoln, mm -hmm. um, the bullet that killed Lincoln is there at that museum, oh, um, cool. or things like that. So mm -hmm. that was cool just to be there yeah. and all that. Um, nice. Yeah, so I did that. Um, while I was at USF, I was the forensic anthropology lab manager. So we worked with surrounding law enforcement agencies, including Pinellas, mm -hmm. um, on cold cases or active skeletal cases um, when it came to either recovering those cases um, so physically going out. Yes. Okay. So whether they're buried bodies or skeletons scattered on the surface, we would go out and help recover those to make sure we get all the bones mm -hmm. and then also do an analysis in the lab. So we would do a forensic anthropology analysis. So I was a manager for that. Um, and then I graduated um, and worked some other places. <laughs> uh, where did you work? Where did you work? Yeah, we want to know those places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be vague. Okay. This is where it's at right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after I graduated, I was actually hired by a university in England, um, the University of Lincoln, to basically help teach at a master's in forensic anthropology program. So I moved there. Uh, I only stayed there for a year. So you were pretty good at this is what you're telling us. Um, Maybe you are pretty good at this. I'm not trying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> You're trying. Right. And it's like, yeah, come to Hogwarts and teach. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it was really cool. So there were students, basically, they're getting their masters. Um, so I helped to mentor those students. They had to do a thesis project. So I helped them come with a project and teach classes. It was cool there because, like here in the U.S., you have. Um, skeletons at universities that might be like old anatomical skeletons and we would use those to teach but over there you have like old roman skeletons from roman uh -huh. cemeteries and so just completely different as far as like the history that you mm -hmm. have to use to teach it's not like oh ethel was a hell of a bowler look at her arm and it's like no these are like exactly historic, throwing you know, javelins yeah, yeah. 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 fighting cool. lions and stuff exactly so that was awesome that's what romans do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Only the criminal ones <laughs> and, the, and the Christians. They were, yeah. they were fed to lions. Okay, yes. all right, all right. Anyway, So sorry. I did that for a year, um, decided England wasn't my cup of tea. Mm. Oh, nice oh. one. <laughs> yes. Um, it was very cold and rainy, and mm. so I moved back uh, to Tampa. My now husband lives here, um, and I actually started working for a nonprofit organization called History Flight, mm. and that organization was funded by the Department of Defense to recover World War II missing in action and killed in action U.S. service members. Is it based so, here? Um, they were based out of Key West. Okay. Um, but essentially they had anthropologists and um, they had um, like retired army medics, EOD technicians um, working for them. And we could live anywhere in the U.S. And they basically just fly us to wherever we were being deployed essentially for the recovery. So how did you find out about that? Like, um, a do you colleague? have like veteran, like in your family or, um, so my brother is in the air force, um, okay. but a colleague of mine who he was actually the anthropologist that I worked for at the Georgia Bureau investigation. When I did that internship, he, hmm. um, called and recommended me to this company. So he knew that I had just moved back. So gotcha. it worked out perfectly. Um, and so I did multiple stints, um, in the central Pacific in an Island called Tarawa. Um, basically the battle of Tarawa occurred. It was a three day long battle and we lost about 3000 Americans during that battle. It was basically, it was occupied by the Japanese and we wanted that Island because it had an airstrip on it. So we wanted to basically progress closer to Japan, but we wanted that Island in order to do so. So we, um, would go there and basically work with the locals. The locals learned that if they were digging in their backyard or wherever and they found bone, then they would come find us and we would recover those bones. So and that was a pretty common occurrence that they would be it was. So digging in their backyard. This island bones. essentially is about one square mile big. Tiny. Yes, yeah. it's tiny. What? Uh, yeah, and it's so populated. Basically all the local um, islands the individuals that live on those have moved to this small island in Tarawa um, because it has the internet, it has processed food, it has school systems. 
um, school systems with air quotes. <laughs> yes, um, and all, so they all would because they have that a- airport or well, what? so they do have an airport there. Um, there's also um, an area for like shipping container ships to dock, so they get okay. a lot of um, okay. food. Whereas some of the other islands don't have that type of infrastructure, mm-hmm. so it's so populated that they run out of space for their trash and and everything else. So um, they would dig and basically bury their trash all around their house. Okay. Um, and so when they would find bone in the past, it was no big deal because their entire lives, they've just found bone. Mm-hmm. Basically, we lost Americans, but over f- about 5,000 Japanese died. Some of those may have been Korean slaves. We know that they had Korean slaves there as well. Um, but it was just a normal occurrence to them to find these skeletons and they've just put their trash in and put it all back in. So we would have people come to us be like, oh, maybe like three years ago, I was digging a hole for my trash and found bones because they would hear through the grapevine that that's what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. So we would dig um, and we would recover any bones that we found. So And trash. Yes, we would go through the trash too. It was great. Um, But even if it was a Japanese soldier, we would also recover them. Um, and return them over to the Japanese. How, um, how could you tell who yeah. was who? What were some of the ways you used to identify them? The primary way in the field is actually um, clothing, like their boots mm. were completely different. So we oh. knew what boots Americans were issued. It was uh, the hobnail boots, okay. um, where there's like nails in a U shape on the heel. And the Japanese were completely different. So that also the different guns that might be found with them. Um, or other clothing items we could distinguish. Mm. So obviously if we had any doubt, then we would keep them and do DNA first. What's the, oh, okay. Sorry, I'm stuck on this. What is like, what, what is the nationality of people that live on this island? Like where, like what's their... Um, they're, they're, so, they're in the, the Federated States of Micronesia, right? They're part uh, of Micronesia, I think. I, I, used, I used to be really into it because I wanted to oh, dive okay. in there. And oh, then, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Lots so, of really good wrecks. Mic- micro- Micronesia? Micronesia. So basically it's right on the equator. Um, we would fly to um, Fiji mm. and then fly basically back up like a three-hour flight over to Tarawa. Um, but, I mean, it's a beautiful island. Mm. It's not clean at all. You said um, one square mile. So the area that we were working in where That's the one. battle occurred um, okay. is part of kind of like an atoll, a you know what an atoll is? An nope. Um, <laughs> but, so an atoll is basically like kind of like a circular-ish structure with like a um, lagoon in the middle. Okay. So, yeah. and the circle has like a reef around it. Mm. Um, and so basically we um, would go there and recover any um, remains that were found from the trash. And then we would also, based on historical maps and stuff like that, we would also look like in the roads and stuff like that for some burial trenches and cemeteries that we were looking for to try to find the Americans. Um, while I was there, we probably recovered um, a little over 30 that I can think of. Um, including Full skeletons? Yeah. Yeah. So the primary location that we found skeletons, um, there was a burial trench. So they had single or like a couple burials together. But then after the battle, they would basically use a bulldozer and create a, a huge um, trench and basically put the soldiers side by side. Um, and they tried to keep record of who was kind of in what order, but there's a lot of conflicting conflicting information as far as if they were buried at sea, um, if they were actually buried at all, because some of the, the now men who have been um, interviewed, they would talk about basically they approached Tarawa too early. So someone essentially jumped the gun and they went in at low tide, even though um, there were some um, informants who had lived there previously from New Zealand who suggested they wait until high tide because essentially the reef was anywhere from like 100 to 200 yards away from the beach. And some of the boats that they were bringing in couldn't get over the reef. And so they would get stuck on the reef and they would jump out of these boats um, and some of them drowned because they were carrying so much heavy equipment. Um, some that did make it over the reef basically had to wade in water from like chest, obviously all the way down to like knee deep water for yeah. a football field or two yeah. um, under, while the Japanese, fire. yeah, wow. while the Japanese are shooting at them. So wow. some of the men that 
lived basically said that they remember looking and seeing bodies just like floating back out to sea of some of them that died. And I say, I mean, they're men now, but they were boys then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we didn't know how accurate some of the death records were as mm-hmm. far as the cemeteries, but we did find a large trench with a huge um, number of these soldiers and we're able to recover them. So after we would do the recoveries, we would send them. There's a lab in Hawaii that actually does the DNA analysis. And they're the ones that have the DNA reference samples for okay. um, World War II. So they make those identifications. So these oh. aren't these really aren't like people that are you know, POW, MIA. Like these are like their families know that they died in the battle for the most part or mostly. Yeah. yeah, Because if they're keeping record of, then they're notifying. So, but obviously some that you're saying potentially floated out to sea or whatever. Yeah. It would be, you know, MIA, you know, right. Okay. So, I mean, technically they are missing in action because they don't know where they are. Okay. So, um, but yeah. So, so any, any body that's unaccounted for is technically MIA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Even Mm -hmm. if they know that they're, Mm-hmm. Okay. Or they're presumed dead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we we would think that they're buried there, but they could have been buried at sea. So we just mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is it an ongoing project? Are people still looking for bodies there? It or? is, absolutely. Okay. So um, that company still does work there. So about 3,000 Americans died. And after the battle, the U.S. government sent um, individuals to basically find those the individuals that died and repatriate them. And they only found about half. So they only found about 1,500. Okay. Um, so of those that are buried there versus at sea, we don't know for sure. Um, but they're still looking for the remaining individuals that died. And what happens to the remains afterwards? They're, they're repatriated. Yep. So they're repatriated. It's really cool because we would have a ceremony there to where the U S government would send like a C-17 and they would have the caskets with the flags draped over and conduct a cemetery like that. Mm -hmm. And then they'd basically be analyzed back at the lab at Hawaii for the, the identification. That's really yeah. cool. Were, yeah. the, were the Japanese taking part in it too? Or? So we would collect those remains, recover them, treat them just the same, and we would return the Japanese. But while I was there, they would basically come and do a mass cremation. So okay. they didn't have the same efforts to identify as we do, um, most likely just cultural differences. Mm-hmm. Um, but we would that's how we would handle those. Okay. Mm. How long did you do that? Uh, just under two years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I also, that same company was starting, um, focused on World War II. Um, so they also did some recoveries in Europe as well. So one of the recoveries I did for them was a P-47 plane crash mm. in Germany. Um, so the P-47 was in a dogfight with a German plane um, just before Christmas in 1943. And locals remember seeing one of the planes go down. And we thought that was the American that we were looking for. So out in the middle of these beautiful this forest, um, you could see a huge divot in the ground, very clear divot. And that After was all the, this time, you could yeah, still see. that was the crash wow. crater. Hmm. So unfortunately, most of the plane parts um, during the war were basically salvaged by mm-hmm. locals. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to have that mm-hmm. um, to use. But we were able to, it took quite some time, but we were able to recover about six or seven small bone fragments and, and probably about two inches each wow. in size. Wow. And we were able to get DNA from those and they identified him. Um, how, do you, how do you go about even searching an so, area that wide for, so for we, bones? Crazy. Yeah. So we screened um, all the dirt in the crash crater and wow. then basically scraped the dirt and screened it around it. So okay. we kind of found um, with evidence on like, we would find small plane parts. And as we were finding that, we actually had a specialist who specialized in like old World War II planes. Mm -hmm. And so we would find writing or stuff like that on the plane parts. And um, he would identify that actually was a P-47. So at least we knew we were in the right place. Mm -hmm. Um, But because of that, we could kind of see the direction that the plane was headed and where the crash crater kind of um, expanded into the, the woods. So we would screen that and just look for bone um, okay. through the soil. How deep were like with the bones that you found? You were, I mean, was are you, are you talking like you're just going to take, because I'm sure you're, what do they call the things that you put? A screen. Oh, a screen. There it is. <laughs> sifter. <laughs> I don't a sifter. Know. Whatever. That's, That's what I'm I would think. Sifting. Yeah. 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 So, so, screen. so you okay. just, I mean, you're taking scoops of dirt and put it in, in, in the screen. We are. So, and when we went, it was, 
in the middle of the winter in mm. Germany, which I'm not sure why we did that. Mm. Um, and a lot of it was like clay, muddy dirt. So we actually had to get water and bring it into the middle of the generators basically to pump water. And we had hoses. So we would water screen a lot of it mm. to find the bone and the, um, the plain parts because... I mean, bone covered in dirt just looks like a rock. Yeah. Right. So we wanted to make sure that we found anything that was there. And then at what point do you have enough? I mean, I'm yeah. sure you could dig out there for... You could. So uh, I wasn't the one making that decision, mm-hmm. luckily. Um, but we had kind of all convened and decided that we had done our best. We knew we had some bone. So, you know, if the bone didn't result in DNA, then we could have potentially gone back. Mm-hmm. Um, but it did, and the family was happy with what we had to okay. where they could return home. So they just wanted to know, like, this is where... That was yeah. where he was, and right. they had part of him to to bury with their family. Because mm-hmm. obviously you don't need a whole skeleton to, you know, I just didn't know if there's yeah. like as how, far much, as ID. how much are you yeah. wanting to get. Like, yeah. you have you don't need a lot to ID, but, like, are you trying to mm-hmm. literally recover as much as you can? Or, I mean, that would obviously be ideal and the mm-hmm. goal, but um, for something like that, especially how much time had passed, and we also didn't know... Um, we had locals coming who were obviously kids at the time and they would talk about um, being there in Germany and like a black cloud would come over their head and they would look up and it's just like mass amount of planes, Mm -hmm. just hearing the stories like that. But they said they remembered it happening and they would say that like their dad buried Helm next to the crater or they buried them in the local cemetery. So we didn't know for sure. Right. Yeah. So there were that literally may have been all that was left of them. Right. Because it could have been moved. Exactly. That's cool. That's what's what's the smallest size bone that you can identify as human? Like these were these were tiny, tiny little uh, bits? They or? were. So I mean a tooth. You could oh. do DNA from a tooth. I would say a tooth is probably one of the most accurate or useful for DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually I mean you just need a small window of like a square inch. Okay. Um, would be ideal. Of anything. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So I, I think this would have been, this was while you were at USF. This was after I graduated. Well, that was after, but I'm pivoting oh. to Dozier. Okay. Is that yes. how you say it? Yes. So that was a huge thing. Um, can you just, that was a, that was in Mariana, North Florida. Uh, very, I mean, it was, it dominated headlines for several years, I think really, yeah. as they uncovered the horrors of the, the Dozier School for Boys. But you got to work on that uh, while you were at USF, right? I did. So I was a lab manager there. So um, my professor at USF was really um, the driving force behind our participation in this project. She was very passionate about it, and she was a great advocate for this. So we had basically um, come to know about this project. There were men who were at the Dozier School for Boys in the 50s and 60s, and essentially Dozier... Um, which was the school name when it closed, um, but it was opened in 1900 um, and it just closed in 2011. But the school initially opened because the state of Florida decided that they wanted a place for kids to go who were um, in trouble, essentially, that was apart from the prison system. So back in the late 1800s, the prisoners participated in the convict lease system. So they were leased out to local farms or Um, anywhere to get work and basically the state would be paid for their labor. Um, So the goal was to have a separate location for them to be sent. Um, Cities throughout Florida basically um, competed in a bid process in order to get it because they knew it would bring in jobs. In the city of Mariana, which is basically, it's on I-10 about an hour west of Tallahassee. They were the ones to win the bid. So they promised a certain amount of acres. Um, They also basically promised a certain amount of dollar amount in order to start the school. So they started the school. Initially, it was boys and girls that were sent there. Um, And eventually, they created a different school for just girls. So they realized quickly that was probably not a good idea to have them both together. Um, But boys or men now, boys that were there in the 50s and 60s, came forward and they're called the White House Boys. So there's a building on the campus, that's the White House, and they um, would discuss um, the abuse and torture that they would receive in this White House while they were there. 
And that kind of sparked more discussion. And then we had family members coming forward who said that their family member, their brother, their uncle died while at the school and they don't know what happened to their body. They maybe went up to the school and either were told that he's already been buried, you can't take him. Um, And so it was basically their life's mission, their parents' life mission to find this relative. Um, So my professor started this project and we basically went up to locate um, where are the boys buried that died there. So the state of Florida had on record that 31 boys died at the school who were buried there. So more died, but some were recorded to have been sent home, supposedly. Um, So they had 31 on record. So there was one cemetery on site that was marked and it had 31 white crosses. Um, We learned later they were just arbitrarily placed in nice rows. Um, And we didn't know if there were other cemeteries on the school grounds or if they were all there. So we, we conducted different survey methods. We did ground penetrating radar throughout the whole area. And that's basically uh, equipment that we use that sends radio waves down to the ground. It can tell us if the ground has been disturbed previously. So we did that. We did trenching to look for different um, burial shafts. So you can look at the soil if you dig a trench to see how differently it looks because you can tell if there's a burial there, if there's something buried. Um, And eventually, after quite some time, we decided and got permission to recover the remains that were there at that main cemetery. So we um, recovered 55 or found 55 graves. Um, We think that there was a total of 51 actual individuals there. Mm -hmm. So in... um, In the early 1900s, soon after it opened, there was a fire on site where there were boys um, basically locked on the third floor of this wood dormitory. Mm. And no one had a key that worked there. And a fire started and they basically died in the fire. But there was no record of exactly how many boys. Two staff members also died in the fire. So they were also buried here in the cemetery. And so we don't know if every burial that they had, they were actually, we found them, they were buried in like infant caskets, infant coffins, um, and it's just a pile of bones. So we don't know if they actually knew how many were there and they just guessed and put that many uh, Mm. caskets in place or, or what. So, um, but we think there's over 50 burials that were located at this cemetery. And just horrible, horrible things that happened at that school Mm -hmm. for decades, Mm -hmm. right? There were were beatings and torture and rape and possibly allegations of, yeah. yeah. They would say kids ran away, but they actually were beaten to death. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so first, um, a technical thing. So, ground, ground penetrating radar. So that actually, I, I was under the impression for some reason that it actually will show you something underground. But all that's really, I wish. Well, I mean, not, <laughs> like, not like an ultrasound, you can well, see. Yeah. No, I mean not like what it is, but but so all you're really seeing is when there's a variance in the soil. Exactly. Okay. So we actually have a ground penetrating radar here yeah. at the sheriff's office, and we use it for. Um, anytime we're looking for burials, like in cold cases and things like that. Mm-hmm. All right. So w- now were all of those graves that were up there, so you said there was like the 31 crosses. Mm-hmm. So were they all in that general area at least, or were they? So the crosses were kind of in the middle, and I would say the cemetery that we found, the actual burials, were probably expanded. Like the cross probably made up like one-sixth of the area. Of what was actually. So we had to expand quite a bit. Um, some of the men that were there talked about they were actually the ones told to dig the graves. And some of these graves were truly six feet deep, which if you've ever dug a burial, which I may be the only one at the table that has so. uh, for training, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's not easy. And up there you have that Georgia red clay, mm-hmm. even though we're in Florida. Um, so it's hard to dig, but they were told to, to dig the burials. Um, and so we would document how deep they were and, and now, were they in caskets, most of them? Some of them. Okay. So some had very elaborate casket hardware. Some were just in like pine boxes that we could tell. And then some we didn't see any evidence of caskets. So we don't know if the caskets were donated to the school or, or what the, the deal with that was. And like, could we, I'm sure y'all were able to figure out like what the most recent, bur- like time frame wise, right? Like what was the, like the, the last person that was buried there? Like, can you tell that? Can you determine that? Um, we were able to kind of look at some of the casket hardware, also like clothing, maybe 
the clothes were not present, but you could see like belt buckles or things like that, that had them. Some of the boys had marbles in their pockets. I know. Um, So we could look at that and then try to determine what time frame they were from. Um, We were also, we collected all the remains. We took them back to our lab at USF and were able to do um, and a skeletal analysis on them. So we were able to age them based on dental development and then also do ancestry. So we could see um, based on dental characteristics what their ancestry was to and help try to narrow down. Piece together the time frame that exactly, way. Exactly, yeah. Okay. What, what was the age range of the yeah. kids that were there? Um, at the school in general. Mm-hmm. So, oh, or, or there at the, the bones that you found. So oh. the school in general, and we think even for some of the bones, we saw um, boys as young as six being sent there um which and, it was an alternative to like prison yeah yeah but i know a lot and, of the kids they, they weren't like criminals they didn't shoot somebody they might have just been like truant or so we know, declared we went to the, some way. the florida state archives basically has these huge paper hardback books mm-hmm. so we would go through those and take pictures anytime a kid died to try to figure out oh. because the hardest part of this project was finding family reference samples because a lot of families don't know that they had a relative there Oh, so, wow. yeah, so each row in this, basically, um, this book was mm-hmm. essentially a child that was sent there. So we knew their name, their age when they were sent there, where they were from, um, what their offense was, which ranged obviously from severe stuff to like murder, but that was rare. Normally it was incorrigibility, yeah. um, theft um dependency in the end we found out that orphans or wards of the state were also sent there because they didn't have anywhere else to put them i guess um so it was just crazy seeing them on that log book and it would list um when they were sent there if they escaped the date they were recaptured things like that so pretty sad yeah jeez Mm. now that i have kids and i have boys i can't even imagine Mm -hmm kids that young being sent there oh. and many of them their sentence was until the age of 21 oh. so they were either released at 21 or if it was a more serious crime they were sent to prison at that time their life was oh. over yeah. basically mm-hmm. jeez mm. depressing yeah <laughs> well but it's it's really important work that you're doing though yeah. i mean in in that case the you know stuff recovering soldiers and things i mean is that you know people i guess get into forensic anthropology for they all have their everybody has their niche that they're kind of into were you always into that sort of, i mean finding the answers like solving the puzzle or was it more like on the actual science of it focus or did you kind of just kind of fall into it per se where hey this this is cool and and oh by the way we're doing really cool stuff like i guess what i'm trying to ask is like what comes first to you like the mission like what we're accomplishing or the science or has it morphed over the years? I would say it's both. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, initially I mentioned I wanted to go into forensic pathology, but the soft tissue of the body is not always there, but your skeleton is. Mm-hmm. So, And it can tell a story about you for a long, long time, mm-hmm. way past mm-hmm. your death. So I like that mystery and those clues. Um, I like being able to see what bones you broke during life or... Um, work that you've had to your teeth or things like that that can help with identification. And I like helping families find answers and also returning individuals to families. Mm-hmm. So I, I, when when somebody, uh, how involved are you when you make these recoveries as far, I mean, do you, obviously the Dozier thing, like there were a lot of people involved in that, I'm sure. There were. A lot of the families that were, you know, involved or concerned, they were actually up there, you know, mm-hmm. with you guys. Is there any is there any one recovery in particular, whether it was part of Dozier, one of the you know missing soldiers, or anything for you that was like particularly special, rewarding? <laughs> I oh, all of them. Yeah, I mean, I like all of them. There was no like standout like. No, I mean, I think so. We recently um, I worked with Detective Chalmers mm-hmm. on a cold case, and we did a huge um, excavation mm-hmm. here in Largo. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were looking for a missing female um, who went missing. Um, This was one of the the black women who was, yes, who was missing in the eighties. who was presumed to have been killed along with at least three, possibly five other. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. By the same person. So we, there was property that the 
potential suspect owned um, here. And he had made comments that, oh, you're walking over her every day or things like that. So the daughter of this missing female, her entire life has wondered if her mom was on this property. So we thought it would be an easy excavation, scrape the surface, see if there's anything buried and done. Well, the entire property had trash buried. (laughs) So it ended up being over a week long project, but the entire time the daughter and her family um, were sitting there like rooting us on, supporting us. Obviously they wanted to see if we were finding anything, but the fact that they were there the whole time Mm -hmm. was very different than what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. Usually the family, Doja was a little different, but usually I don't interact with the family very often. So that was unique in a sense that she was there. She was asking questions. She was genuinely interested in what we were doing, the process we were doing. And the last day I spoke to Dr. Chalmers and we decided we had basically done as much as we could. Mm -hmm. And having to tell her that, Mm -hmm. that we didn't find her mom was very, very hard and emotional Mm -hmm. uh, because she was obviously very disappointed, but could not have been any more grateful for the work that we did and very appreciative. So that was rewarding, although we weren't successful, mm-hmm. um, but having her there made it really different. Different, yeah. yeah. To know, like to have that instant gratification of like the work I do is rewarding, yeah. I would yeah. think. And we were Since we were doing usually. that, which is something that she had wanted for years yeah. to see if her mom was there. So the fact that she can drive by that lot now and not wonder if her mom is there. Yeah. Yeah. At least we're giving her that. Yeah. And she knows that her mom isn't forgotten. That, that Absolutely. If there are right. any clues or new evidence that we're willing to do whatever it Absolutely. takes to, to investigate. Yeah. yeah. Detective yeah. Chalmers is awesome. So he is. Yeah. Next he time is. he wants to do another dig, I'll be right there. <laughs> he is awesome. He is awesome. Yeah. He was yeah. our first guest. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, all right. So what brings you to the sheriff's office? How do you end up here? You get tired of, of digging trash in the <laughs> islands. What, what happened? <laughs> so while I was in Tarawa, um, my husband... He lives here Mm -hmm. and we decided we wanted to start a family. Mm -hmm. So Tara was not the ideal place. There were mosquitoes. You don't want to raise a kid on a garbage island? Uh, (laughs) Garbage island. (laughs) So you, but, so you were, you were, you were married at that point and you were doing that for however long and he was here. Yeah. So we we got married about halfway through my time. And did you say how long you would stay out there at a time? We would go for about two months and come back for two weeks and keep going in that cycle. So, um, it, it was it was wonderful while it lasted, mm-hmm. but it wasn't sustainable mm-hmm. yeah. and definitely not with a family. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then Tarawa had um, mosquito-borne illnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, just, it was gross. A real charming island. Yes. Huh. The, uh, the locals, you would find feces everywhere. Anyways. When you got to go, you got to go. I guess. I guess so. <laughs> you only have one square mile to go in. Yes. So. <laughs> you run out of space. Um, uh, there's oh. actually a... Um, <laughs> There's an American Sherman tank still on the beach, um, and we have pictures of it right after the battle, and then yeah. I took pictures of it while I was there. So cool, but you don't dare touch it because you know that there's people squatting and, like, going to the restroom all over it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, so... <laughs> so every I, time you look at that picture, you think about that. Yeah. Yes. I still want to go to Micronesia, but not that island. <laughs> So it would be cool for diving because you have so many yeah. plane crashes yeah, good wrecks, and stuff like that wrecks, for sure. like mm. historic stuff. But I was there and decided that I needed to start looking for jobs back in Tampa Bay area. Um, I saw the job posted here for a forensic quality assurance coordinator. And, and were you like, what the heck is that? I, I read the job description and wasn't too familiar with it just because my entire experience has been either in academics or as a forensic anthropologist. Mm-hmm. Um, so my husband and I would read it and he's like, Oh, you, you got that. You, it can't be too bad. So I applied. Um, and luckily when they call me for an interview, I just happened to be in my two week mark. So we did my interview, um, not long after my interview, um, at the time, assistant chief Joel mm-hmm. calls me and wants me to come to a meeting with him and the chief deputy at the time, which they call me and I have no clue who this person is, you know? So I'm just going into a meeting with the person that called me. Uh, And they hired me. So I think I went back to Tarawa one more time and then uh, started working here. Wow. 
Wow, that was and, and, and you come in. Oh, so what did you do before this? Like, <laughs> right? Like there's ever been a question answered to, to that level? You know? <laughs> no, I bet you everyone's just. <laughs> yes. <Wow. laughs> um, so, at the time though, that was literally. I mean, we had not even started the accreditation process yet, right? Correct. So before I started, um, they had done a lot of research and basically proposed to the sheriff to go through this process and he was fully on board mm -hmm. and he made the decision he wanted to get accredited in the United States. Um, there are multiple States that require accreditation for their forensic labs. Uh, Florida is not one of them yet, but the fact that we're being proactive is really um, says a lot about our agency and our administration. Mm -hmm. So they made that decision uh, and so after I started, I met with the sheriff and my chain of command to kind of talk about the process and what it was going to entail. Um, and it was definitely a challenge. I knew coming in that I wasn't going to be everyone's favorite person, <laughs> but I was okay with that. Um, mm -hmm. but it also, I had a lot of experience working with like standard operating procedures and stuff like that. So it helped prepare me for the job here. And you really never worked in a, well, you were you were you managed um, F or USF's forensic lab, mm -hmm. but then like was that the same kind of forensics ish that we're doing here or not? Not um, really. It's not the same. Not the same. Mm -hmm. So I because of that I had a lot of experience working with law enforcement mm -hmm. side by side mm -hmm. um, and kind of knowing you know what a detective does versus crime scene mm -hmm. things like that. But I've never worked in a law enforcement agency, so that was definitely an adjustment. And you obviously shared that in your interview, and everybody's like, "Yeah, they were fine with go. it." You did all kinds of cool so stuff. And I think, and even at the time, um, Chief Deputy Simovich he said that he was looking for someone who, from the outside, could be completely objective. Mm. So they had internal people apply, and they wanted someone who could come in with a fresh eye and mm. look at our current policies and procedures in place and see what needed to change, um, what was still okay, things like mm. that. Because you were coming in and telling people who had done the job for maybe 20 or 25 years, they were not going to do it this way anymore. Yes. Yeah, that must have been <laughs> difficult. That was the struggle. And yeah. I think even the sheriff acknowledged that that would be an obstacle and kind of a hurdle for us. Um, and our, I know y'all talked um, about forensics on the podcast previously, but our crime scene essentially, and even our latent print unit are huge mm -hmm. compared to other agencies. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely one of the biggest in Florida, if mm -hmm. not the mm -hmm. Southeast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so the number of people to relay this information to and to get to make these adjustments was definitely, um, definitely hard. So what kind of things are you talking about? I mean, what are some of the things that, so you're coming in, you're learning what the, what the requirements for the accreditation are. You're doing that, yes. but then you're, you have a clean slate basically. So what were some of those like initial things like low hanging fruit? Like, okay, guys, like we got to, you know, like what were some of the, the, the most obvious things at first? I'm just curious, like, cause if you're, whatever you're doing, the new girl pissing everybody off with these new rules and <laughs> oh. stuff, like what, what were they? So I would learn the requirements and basically I was the manager or I was the messenger, sorry, yeah. between what the requirements are saying and basically the implementation of those mm -hmm. changes. So I would say probably the first thing that we implemented that pissed people off was where they can process and package their evidence. Mm -hmm. So when I first came in, we had basically every forensic specialist has their own desk mm -hmm. and they would take their evidence to their desk, package their DNA swabs, their latent guns that they collect, um, and then they would submit that to property and evidence. But after they do that, then they're eating their lunch or... Um, you know, not necessarily washing their desk every time. Mm -hmm. So, so, we, so like a, a murder weapon covered with blood, a knife could be packaged at the essentially, desk. Essentially, yes. They could would get a little bit of Cheeto dust. It would most <laughs> yeah. likely already be. Your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> it would most likely already be in a package, but as uh -huh. far as sealing it. Okay. Um, and, and for the record, this was not causing a problem per se, but part no, of the accreditation no. process, right. we're trying to elevate that. So we're exactly. more airtight when we're going to court. Mm -hmm. things yeah. Like yeah that. So yeah, not that, that for me, happening. that <laughs> aspect was more of a safety concern mm -hmm. to yeah. our members. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and that was also right before the fentanyl mm -hmm. epidemic really mm -hmm. started up, yeah. which that would have even more so supported oh, this yeah. change. Yeah. Um, but so we basically made them 
go directly into the lab when they come back from uh, a crime scene and they Mm -hmm. package it there. So no evidence goes to their desk anymore. Um, So that did make them happy. Uh, But it's just changed. So, and then I think probably the big change that we still deal with is the amount of documentation. Mm -hmm. So accreditation is very particular about the amount of documentation that you provide and that you take Mm -hmm. while you're actually doing your analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I first started, our crime scene investigators, which are forensic specialists or latent print examiners, took very minimal notes, um, similar to deputies, where they would write the case number, maybe the address. Sometimes that was it. Um, as far as just the notes they would take on, on the scene. On the scene. Yeah. And then they would write the report based on memory, photographs, things like that. But accreditation is basically saying, are you willing to take that risk of if you go to a crime scene today mm-hmm. and you quit or are somehow unable to write your report tomorrow, are you willing to take the risk by having those minimal notes? So essentially we've had to dramatically increase the amount of notes that we take in order to ensure that we have that type of documentation. So now they write everything they do, everything they process, whether they got positive and negative results, um, the methods that they use, things like that. And that basically ensures that all of that is documented at the time and none of that information will be lost to where someone could write the report and maybe even testify for them later on if they're unable to. Was there a, a case or a situation where finally everybody was like, all right, I get it now. I know why we're doing this. Because obviously, if you're, a, if you're an attorney or whatever and you're trying to question the quality of our work, mm-hmm. at some point, knowing that we're accredited and, and that you're in there upsetting people, at least at the front <laughs> end, like, you got to know that, okay, I, you know. It's going to cut out half of their arguments. Right, Yeah, there's right. not I much mean, they can not, object to not anymore. You're not able to poke right. as many holes in, yeah. you know, whatever. I would say there wasn't a specific case. Mm-hmm. So when I came in, I was very lucky to where our agency is top notch and has been from the beginning. They are passionate about what they do. They love their work and they're really good at it. Mm-hmm. So from the surface, you don't really see the changes that we made. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, they have really great luck getting latents at all different types of scenes. And that goes to latent print examiner, um, so the changes that we made were really below the surface, mm-hmm. um, not necessarily always exposed to those d- defense attorneys, although they are getting more and more savvy knowing that we have notes and things like that now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say there wasn't a specific instance where it was like an aha moment. Um, but I do think that some of these changes that we made, the individuals are realizing how important it is. Mm-hmm. And they are seeing questions coming from defense attorneys that, they're grateful to have some of the stuff in place and that allows them to be prepared for those questions. Good. Well, it's mm-hmm. good that they, I mean, I know we got together the value a black presentation it. when you got it done, yes. but I'm glad people are kind of seeing the operational, um, you know, benefits, uh, benefits of it too. Hopefully. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, so, oh gosh, we need to talk about her actual job more instead of all the cool stuff. Um, the forensic science specialists, they testify in court. Is there any, ever any time that you have to? Uh, I do testify. Um, So I testify more um, outside of work for the forensic anthropology cases that I work. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, But some quality managers or quality assurance coordinators do have to testify, and I've seen some of that happen. So it is possible that I may have to. Mm -hmm. Um, Earlier today, actually, um, I was participating in a mock trial. So we have established training programs for our forensic specialists and for our latent print examiners. And part of that training program is a mock trial. So at the end of their training program, we pick a case that they worked and take them over to the courthouse. We ask a bailiff to be there and the bailiff goes out in the hallway, calls their name really loud and brings them in. And essentially the goal is, is for the first time they're in that witness box to not be the very first time they're actually testifying. Mm-hmm. So um, I was the defense for multiple of the forensic specialists, and then I acted as the state attorney for a latent print examiner that went today. Um, but we did that. They did so good. Um, <laughs> but it just... got to be so intimidating, though. Yeah, I, mean, I bet there are people that like wouldn't flinch at a gruesome crime scene who oh, would yeah. just go all to pieces oh, if they have to be in front well, of an audience Especially when they're your peers asking oh, questions. Yeah. Yeah. And we had... 
some people in the jury box as well um, that they could turn and look at. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they were terrified, but they did really good. That's awesome. That's a great story you could do next time you do one. Yeah, we should. You can sit in the jury box. Yeah, you could. I can. Yeah. Yeah. You'd love it. We have a couple more that have to go. So, okay. Yeah. Just, just let me know. <laughs> I will. For Absolutely. Sure. Um, now they're going to be more terrified. I'll <laughs> <laughs> be there taking notes all the time. Yeah, exactly. Interview them after. She's really like scoring what was the worst them. part. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I would. They were the worst. <laughs> um, so, what is, uh, what is the cycle on accreditation? So, you got it done, I think. Finally, not finally, but I mean, it, it was done. We received it in 2018. So we had our first initial assessment mm-hmm. uh, in November 2018, and they actually come back or do an assessment every year. Okay. So every year we either have an on-person assessment or remote assessment. And every fourth year is a full reassessment. So they're going to come and do from A to Z every um, discipline. So crime scene and latent prints. So I had that in 2022 then. Yes. Uh, yes, so, right. Okay. Bam. <laughs> Good yeah. job. I can work in fiscal if this doesn't work out. <laughs> um, so what is the, when you're kind of in between, I guess, just what is your day-to-day like? I mean, you're, you're, you're checking logs, making sure everybody's doing, I mean, what is that? So it varies like from a hall year. monitor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, all of our policies and procedures have to be reviewed annually. Mm-hmm. So we kind of do that cyclical. Mm-hmm. Um, also, everyone has to partake in a proficiency test. So I um, administer those and procure those from the different proficiency test providers, essentially to demonstrate that they are still proficient in their field. Mm-hmm. So it may be a latent print comparison test for the latent print examiners, processing latent prints, things like that for the crime scene investigators. Um, I also go out to scenes and observe them mm-hmm. to make sure they're following policies and procedures. Um, we also evaluate their testimony, so um, I'll help to facilitate that. It really varies um, greatly, mm-hmm. just kind of all the different stuff that I... So like after with. somebody testifies, you review it and just kind so of... So we watch it live. Okay. Um, and then we have a... I call in a forensic supervisor that's not involved or the latent prank supervisor, um, and we watch them. And we're really looking at um, how they're conducting themselves at the... Um, at the trial? Do they look professional? Are they representing the agency um, in a good way? And then also how technically accurate are there? Do they handle evidence correctly? Do they describe the photos correctly? Mm -hmm. Things like that. They remember the word bubble level. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So you critiqued her after that? (laughs) Poor Rhonda. (laughs) I I know. I don't know if I did that one. (laughs) Um, So you obviously, you get to still go out there and and you you do some things outside of the forensics quality assurance. Forensic. Forensic quality forensic. assurance. No forensic. Um, so outside of that, you still get to do some you, of your... You get to play with bones a little bit still. Yeah. I do. So, so what does yeah. that look like? Was that something that you always kind of... Were you were like, hey, and you can still do some of this stuff? Or was it like, hey, can I still... There's I think an opportunity it was kind here. of assumed. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, basically, we, have, we have a bone person, so we'll send yeah. you the bones. Yeah. So yeah. anytime we have a skeletal case, whether it's a burial or on the surface, I'll go out and help them with the recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really helpful because I can actually do a skeletal analysis on scene to make sure that we've recovered everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Otherwise, do they leave bones behind? Some of the small bones potentially. Yeah. yeah. Or if there's a large scatter, you have animal scavenging that could Mm -hmm. pull bones away. Um, So I've done cases in the past where at the medical examiner, they're missing a whole leg. And so we go back out there and find it. For example, if I'm not there at the scene. So uh, obviously a little bit different than what you're doing before, where you're just trying to get that ID but for criminal cases, potentially, you have to have everything. Ideally, you would have as much as possible. So okay. you're not only are we helping with the ID, but we're also looking for trauma. So, and that's kind of the big criminal question, obviously, for sure. forensics is, is there trauma? So mm-hmm. the more of the skeleton we have, the more confident we can be as far as if there is trauma present or not. So people are sending you bones all the time and pictures. and. So that's kind of my other thing that I've um, become. <laughs> yes. So anytime bones are found, really in the county, I would say, yeah. um, they can send me a picture um, on my agency cell phone with a scale and they'll send me different pictures. Sometimes I've asked for a video of them like rotating it mm-hmm. and I can tell them if it's human or not. So, and really if we're able to determine that right from the beginning with the deputy or detective on scene, then it saves forensic time. They don't have to go out there. Mm. Um, a lot of times the detectives will just still be at home waiting to decide if they have to go out. Mm-hmm. The medical examiner doesn't have to go out. So it saves a lot of time and man hours by able 
by deciding that. So you're on call then yeah. all the time, basically. Yeah. I, it's the I bone don't get, phone. I know. I don't get too many <laughs> in the middle of the night, but it's happened. Uh, yeah. How, yeah. how often are they human bones? Rarely, rarely. <laughs> so I what, would, what are they usually? Animal. So yeah. we get, um, if they're from the beach, nine times out of 10, it's pig foot mm-hmm. um, because they're kept in the, the, the crab, crab traps. traps. Crab traps, yeah. exactly. Um, or people will find... Um, like dog bones in their backyard or things like that. So uh, it just varies, but rarely is it human. When it is human, do you go so out? So excited. Yeah, yeah. But do you go? <laughs> like do yes. you go to the scene? Yeah. yeah. I remember when you were teaching um, a class uh, oh, a couple the, years the ago. skeletons out there. Yes, out there. Yeah. and then it was, the call yeah. came through and whoop, you were gone. And oh. it, those are the so bones you the mangroves, for the whole right? county. So basically, because it was, I yes. think it was a clear water case yeah. that day yeah. or something. So our forensics would respond anyways okay. to go out um, okay. since we have contract agencies with forensics. Okay. So I go out with a specialist and I did the recovery for that scene. And that was actually, it was right on the very tip of Clearwater Beach, like mm-hmm. yeah. past all the houses. It was beautiful. Um, and someone died there. It was not a bad place to be. Yeah. So it was hot that day though. Yeah. What was, what was the story on that? Was that... I don't know. How did they die? I'm not sure. Oh. I I don't know. I guess so there's a lady that owns the house on the northern tip of Clearwater Beach. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's not there very often. Um, I don't know if she's a snowbird or, um, but I guess she's had issues with individual squatting or mm-hmm. um, okay. like staying around her house when she's not there. So I don't know if it was someone like that who was just there when she wasn't there. Um, but someone... Um, I don't know if they're spraying for mosquitoes or something uh, found the skeleton. Yeah. So when you, when you're responding to that type of scene, you're just, you're kind of overseeing and making sure things are collected correctly and all the pieces are there. So I help with the search. So we do line searches. We use um, pen flags, which are little Mm -hmm. colored flags to mark the bones. Mm -hmm. I will kind of direct them of like what to photograph. And then we actually do a hand map. So we can kind of determine the relationship and how far they're spread. And then I'll collect them and do an inventory. And so if we collect them and we're missing a certain bone, then we'll keep looking for it as much as we can. Yeah. Okay. How long does it take Mm -hmm. for a body to become a skeleton in Florida? (laughs) It really depends, Mm -hmm. um, like summer versus winter. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you could look at a week or two potentially, like in the summer. Really? Yeah. Holy moly. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, like, how long has this lady been gone that there's, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it may not be, like, fully, like, there may still be mummified tissue mm-hmm. or something adhered to it. But as far as skeletal, you'll start seeing the skeleton pretty quickly in the summer because oh. you have the rain um, hydrating the tissue and the maggots are eating off of it. And, mm. yeah, so. Yum. Pretty quick. Mm. Cool. <laughs> so what other notable cases working uh working with us on, you know, since you've been around anything else, I mean, you mentioned uh, doing some excavation with uh, Detective Chalmers, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. anything else stand out over the years? Um, we did respond to a scene. Um, it was for one of our contract agencies, but we went out in forensics to assist mm-hmm. um, and it was on the um, Pinellas Trail. Mm-hmm. There was a fire, a car on fire that was found. Um, basically, it was on the trail suspended over water and a biker saw it and it was to the point where fire trucks couldn't get to it. So they basically had to let it burn. And when they went to open the trunk, there was a skeleton in the trunk. Um, So we went out there to do the recovery and it it had already been a skeleton or skeletonized because it was burnt. Most likely because of the burn. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and we, um, that case is already the individual pled so we can talk about it, but um, it was basically the owner of the car that was in the trunk and supposedly he overdosed and they panicked and drove from there and set it on fire. Oh. Um, but that was cool because it's not your typical <laughs> burial. The steps, the steps that people take when they panic with overdoses. We just had that case yeah. last week. It's like, Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm afraid. So let's, so, but yeah, yeah. Cause that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's a lot of extra steps. So a lot less suspicious to have a burned body in a trunk or, on a Is not it? on a part uh, on a part of a trail not accessible yeah. by cars. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, whatever. Job security, I guess. Yeah, I love it. So can <laughs> so. you so if you see how do you can you can obviously tell if can you tell if bones been burned? 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is it literally like charred or is it? It is. So bone goes through a certain color pattern mm-hmm. when it burns. So it goes like um, to like brown to black to like a gray and then almost white mm-hmm. which when it comes almost like porcelain. Um, so the bones there, it had burned so hot and long mm-hmm. that they were white. And if you pick them up, they could potentially just shatter. Fall apart. Mm. So that was one of the reasons they brought me in so that I could help and do an inventory and take everything out as gently as possible mm-hmm. because they didn't know who he was in, at the time. So we took them out. Um, I took some really good photos of the skull to try to help with my analysis later, which is good because his skull did break in the process mm-hmm. because it was so fragile, but they were able to identify him. Oh, that's cool. Well, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. I yeah. ask her questions about bones and stuff for hours. Yeah, what were some other cases that you worked uh, for Pinellas County or Pasco? You, so you work, so you, you do things for us, but then you also work with the District 6 Medical Examiner. I do. So consult, that's a separate consulting thing, right? Yes, so yeah. I consult separately for the medical examiner, and District 6 does all cases for Pinellas and Pasco County. Uh-huh. So if there's skeletons found in Pasco and they have any question of who it is or how they died, then I'll also do the analysis for that. I imagine you get more skeletons in Pasco because more there's more yes. more rural, more people places they, to more places to dump bodies. What are you trying to say about our neighbors she, to the north? Here we just <laughs> they do. We just dump things in alleys here or right. in the water. Yeah. They have woods and up there. A lot of the ones that they find, they're doing so much construction oh, with yeah. new development, yeah. and so they find a lot of the skeletons yeah. up there. Hmm. But believe it or not, St. Pete does get a lot of cases. So, really? Yeah, they um, they have a case um, that I worked where it was a a head on the side of the road just um, a head yeah and so i did the analysis and um he's been identified they don't know how he died um but this is the rest of a jogger bounce? found it no huh. oh i remember so that the it was in the day. news yeah yeah, the, yeah i remember okay. that one interesting wow. so in those situations um when you're doing an analysis like that's after they've already collected it or recovered it correct okay so, so it's not like you have to drop what you're doing and put on your other consultant right. hat and- yeah so they'll do the recovery or i'll do the recovery and then back at the medical examiner we perform an analysis which basically we can tell um, we do a biological profile mm-hmm. which is essentially estimating their age um, whether they're male or female their ancestry and their stature and then we'll look at things like trauma that happened during life, trauma that happened around the time of death, and then any other unique characteristics like medical implants, um, things like that that might be unique about that individual that could help identify them. What are some of the unique things that you have found? Um, Like, you know how you talked about the one lady who Mm -hmm. bowled all the time. What are certain things that looking at our bones can tell you, like, or that you've seen yourself? Um, I mean, I love teeth. So I think it's cool to look at everyone's dental work that they've had. It actually, believe it or not, helps with identification. (laughs) So the more dental work you have, the more likely you are to be identified. Just, you know, that could be my takeaway. Um, Yes, but I don't (laughs) know. Get dental work. (laughs) (laughs) Put something in your teeth to make Uh, you unique. mm -hmm. Um, And you can can tell ethnicity to a certain extent just from the skull. You can. Didn't you do a project on that? I did. So my... um, well, my master's thesis was actually, um, while I was getting my master's and also after I worked in Tucson um, at the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner. And they, while I was there um, during that time frame, they got about 200 skeletons a year just from individuals dying, crossing the border from Mexico. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So it was a huge um, operation to do the analysis and identify them. Um, and so my master's thesis was actually based out of that to help with, um, methods to distinguish male and female of, um, Central Americans and individuals come from Mexico, um, just because they're much smaller mm-hmm. than we are here in the U S. So we needed methods specific for them. Um, and then for my PhD, my dissertation was actually on, um, craniometric analysis. Mm-hmm. So taking measurements of the skull and looking at, the different groups that are kind of coined Hispanic, um, but looking at how different they really are. So we as society kind of group them all together. But I looked at, I um, actually went to Cuba multiple times to collect data. They have a um, skeletal collection there at the University of Havana where um, the uh, individuals who die, there's very limited space in Havana. So they're buried for just a short period of time and then they're actually 
dug up and put somewhere else um, in like a mausoleum. But if the family doesn't pay, then they may not be put in the mausoleum. So they have a skeletal collection there. Um, I had Puerto Rican data from skulls, um, Mexican, and then Guatemalan. And so looking at how um, different population histories impacted those. Mm-hmm. So European influence, African influence, and then Native American influence influenced those different groups very differently based on the history of Cuba versus Puerto Rico, for example. So Cuba, you have the tobacco industry and and Puerto Rico, you didn't. There was much more European influence. So that was my dissertation. Wow. That's cool. A lot of boring information. I thought yeah. it was awesome though. Interesting <laughs> to me, yeah. Do you, do you almost see a face if you look at a skull? Uh, not and maybe not really. all of the details, but no, you don't personalize it like that. But I definitely, so when I teach, I also teach classes mm-hmm. and I talk to people about the differences in like males and females. And I'm like, next time you go out to lunch, look around because you're going to see these differences that we talk about. Um, because you can, I think instead of seeing a face when I look at a skeleton, it's more like I can see your skull when I look at your face. Are you seeing our oh. skulls right now? <laughs> I mean, now I am that we talked about <laughs> that. Wow. Uh, and then you do, um, speaking of teaching, you do some extracurricular teaching and training uh, for us here too. I do, yeah. You guys just did the pig dig. The big pig dig. We've big had been excited about that for two years. Yeah. So tell us about that. So here um, in Pinellas, I teach a three-day recovery of human remains class. And so we have offered that to all of our forensic specialists as well as members of IOB. So some detectives have taken it as well. And our forensic building has a field right next to it. So we bury skeletons, they're plastic skeletons in that field and dig them up essentially in the class. Um, So it gives them more confidence when going into those types of scenes. Um, And then we also do a scatter scene um, on the third day of that class. Um, But also it allows the detectives to experience that as well to kind of know what to expect. Um, About two years ago, we had a shooting reconstruction class and they had a pig that they shot. A pig um, that was already deceased. Yes, from yes, the butchers. absolutely. Yes. And we buried that pig just out of curiosity. Um, and then about two years later, just recently we dug it up and uh, fully skeletal. Um, the bones were even very brittle. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was cool. Yeah, that was fascinating to watch. And it, it was really cool to see the whole the, the whole process and the way that you could tell from the different composition of the dirt that something mm-hmm. was buried there before, you know, when you were two feet away from the bones, even yeah. you, you could tell just by, so t- tell us about some of the things that would, that y- you would see if you were uncovering a buried body. So one thing that we talk about is, um, a burial outline essentially. So when you dig a hole in the ground, you're digging through different layers of stratigraphy, which are basically, the different colored layers of soil. So you may have like a dark loamy topsoil followed by like white sandy material followed by, you know, you might have medium browns or dark browns. Mm -hmm. So when you go through those layers and you're digging and then you put them back in the hole, they're all jumbled and mixed up. Mm -hmm. And so you might see that dark soil around the surface, but then the actual area of that burial is going to be a mixture and almost like a, um, a tie dyed speckled look. So when we're, we shovel scrape the surface and we're looking for a burial and you can see a perfect circle or oval or rectangular outline for where something was previously buried. So what you're saying is is there's no way to hide a body, like bury a body and get away with it. It would be hard. You'd you'd have to pay attention to the soil composition and bring like external soil and layer it exactly the right way. Mm -hmm. Save the dark topsoil. I don't know. <laughs> we don't want to give up. We don't want to give up those tips. No, huh. easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, and so those classes and and that just like w- w- obviously they're still going to call out the experts mm-hmm. when that happens. So what's the goal with training our members with that stuff? So when I go out to scenes, I don't go by myself. Mm-hmm. So they go with me. So to prepare them and so they kind of know what to expect. Mm-hmm. I think it makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, it's fun and it gives them crime scene training they're not normally getting. Um, And then also I do teach a little bit of human osteology, so knowledge of the skeletal system. So they're kind of familiar with human bones. Mm -hmm. So if they do go to a scene and there's a bone, then... I'm going to have to send you that text. 
I mean, normally they do anyways. Yeah. No one wants to make that call. Right. I love through the whole dig they were showing you things. Bone or stone? Yeah, bone or stone. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like I knew what pig bones look like, you know, it's right. fine. Um, <laughs> you get plenty of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Close enough. <laughs> but um, I think it's just, it's a good experience for them and they feel more confident going into those types of scenes. Mm -hmm. What uh, what does uh, the media or TV or movies, what do they get wrong about forensic anthropology? I think just like with any forensic discipline, mm -hmm. um, you know, nothing happens overnight. Mm -hmm. um, I know the few times I've seen Bones, they'll have a skeleton and they'll do like a hologram of what that person's face looks like and things like that. So um, I think that there's some misconceptions about the time and the technology available. Um, but it really is a science that requires a lot of like experienced eye and training and stuff like that. So I think when it comes to testimony and stuff like that, it's really important that you have people with experience and, and that kind of know the difference between the reality and not. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So before we, anything else I want to start, uh, cause you're married to a, Pasco sergeant, detect, a detective sergeant. He's a homicide detective. Homicide, that's what I was mm -hmm. trying to say. I, I know words. Um, <laughs> so that's got to make for some fun conversation at home. But anything else related to work before we talk about the life balance side? I want to know what you want to happen to your, your bones after your... Oh, oh yeah, you chose mortality. It? Now, I chose immortality, so I'm good. I don't have to worry about... <laughs> I, mean, I do want to be fossilized, for the record, if, I, if I was to die. Fossilized? So I have to be like buried in a class, cataclys cataclysmic mudslide. But what would you... <laughs> so specific i really like fossils where that's awesome um i don't, I don't know where's good mudslides around here maybe, maybe a, like a, a like oh, California. rushing river that's, i don't know i mean that's yeah. probably the closest yeah yeah all right noted the next ice age there's laura <laughs> god knows what she was doing when she got frozen or whatever uh, that's, well that's my icebreaker question what do you want to happen to all of your skeletons mm. that's a good one i don't care I it's don't the, either. It's the opposite of an icebreaker. You can yeah. I mean, I kind I of just plan to be cremated, so I'm not taking up a lot of space. But okay. right. that's, some, that's where I'm at. Somebody like just, can use it. So the the porcelain bones is that what happens when they when they um, burn? They just become ash, chunky stuff. powder, and mm -hmm. and then you're blended <laughs> with all the other ones. Uh, well, ideally blended. it's just Ricky, but ideally he puts in a blender, leftovers, and then that's what's given to his family. Oh, they blend you after you're cremated. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize so that. So you're put in the crematorium and they blast fire on your chest. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be cremated. I, I want whatever really? my husband wants. Oh, gosh. Unless it's he a, wants to be cremated. Yeah. <laughs> so the, <laughs> so, I don't know. so the, the bones are still chunky and then they could So be they are. So oh. you can still do like biological profile and stuff from a skeleton before they're blended. Um, Not after. And then you're basically sweeped out of the crematorium, put in this like tray, and then they sort for any medical devices and take those out. And then they put you in this blender and blend you. Wow. And then that's how you go into your family. A body blender. That's why. Have you ever heard of the tri-state crematory? Or, the, or uh -huh. there was a more recent one where that was like, I think it was in Georgia. Essentially, <laughs> the crematorium broke down uh -huh. and he didn't want to maintain mm -hmm. it and fix it. So he was giving family members powdered cement back. Oh, and they, doing what with the bodies? <laughs> so a lady walking her dog in the back found bones and there were hundreds of bodies no. in the back. Yeah. <gasps> wow. And there was just a recent one out west somewhere. <laughs> Last year, <laughs> saving of somebody money. going to just like <laughs> scatter Mima and then they in a river and they come back and there's like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh. Uh, no. oh anyway. my god, it is wow. Anyway, wow. Yeah. See now, the more you know, we're learning so much. Maybe. Okay, so one legitimate question I had that I meant to ask. Uh, so in forensics you know, when they have cases or cold cases or things, you know, anytime like new technology comes out, you know, they'll run that print or they'll run that or, or whatever it is, they'll run that piece of evidence, see if they can get something off it. Is, are there things like that in forensic anthropology where there's like an advancement somewhere? Or I mean, is it pretty much, I mean, cause it seemed what I, my take is, is it's just like, you know, your, your experience and expertise looking at something, but is, is there anything new that develops with that field? Not really. Not as much as we see with like crime scene, for example, mm -hmm. Um, we do have more methods developing, so we'll have like methods on children, for mm -hmm. example, um, estimating the age and the sex of children. 
uh, coming out. So new methods like that as people are doing research, but I wouldn't say new technology okay. is really available too much. That's kind of what I meant, like methods and stuff too. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Because um, I know like like Chalmers, you know, and, and mm-hmm. something new, and now they're doing the genetic genealogy stuff. Like every time yeah. there's something, they're, they're yeah. trying to Yeah, DNA is definitely the... That's the new thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and even more and more, you need less of a sample. Now they're doing genetic genealogy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really the evolving. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, throughout the U.S., there's many unidentified remains that DNA wasn't available at the time that they were actually found. Yeah. So they might have been buried. So there's a big effort to to basically exhume those individuals, do a new analysis, and submit for DNA. Hmm. Um, so... That's do, just, do we have any any like cold case bones that were here from before your time that then you went back and, to take a look at to see if, if you were putting fresh eyes on them would yeah get there have new? been some we yeah. have several at the medical examiner's office um, that are still unidentified so are there um, any cases that excite you? Um, I was there recently and there was a uh, 1961 case where a female. Is that um, the old Tampa Bay or the, um, the, she was found in the water. Yeah. She had a center block around yeah. her leg. So, <laughs> but she was fully, she had tissue still on her when she was found, but she was never identified. Um, and now she was buried for quite some time and they ended up um, exhuming her to try to do DNA. And her bones are in such bad condition that they're struggling to get DNA, but mm. it would be nice to identify. Yeah. Her. Chalmers has been talking about that. Yeah. One too, yeah. So that's interesting. That's yeah. one of them that, I, I they sent. I think they. I think they had sent some stuff off on that one. I think. Yeah. I think they're waiting Hopefully. to see. Hopefully, it's hard because here we live in such a nice vacation spot. Mm-hmm. So you have mm-hmm. people coming from all over the U.S. Mm-hmm. here, which is different from other parts of the U.S. So mm-hmm. it makes it even harder. Yeah. So he has his work cut out for him. Oh uh, yeah. All right. So mm-hmm. husband's a homicide sergeant, Pasco. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's got to be fun dinner conversation. How would you guys meet? So tell me it was over a body. <laughs> It, it was actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he uh, was a detective at the time um, and he came to USF and he did cold cases. So there's a couple unidentified cases out of Pasco too. And so we had a skeleton there at USF and he came in to look at it with us and kind of talk to us about it. Um, so that was the first time I met him. And then he also, we had several agencies come up to help us at the Dozier School Um while we were doing the recoveries and then some other searches. So he came up there. Um, and then he was going to USF to do a guest lecture and he was like, Hey, do you want to go to lunch? And I was like, sure. I'll see if anyone else is available. And he's like, Oh, they're not. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> weird. <laughs> so we went to lunch. At what point did you figure out it was a date? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I, I was like, how did he know everyone's number? Like, <laughs> So That's I learned. That's why you're not a detective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and then he asked me to go out again. So we went to Wiki Watchy as like our first official date. Uh, that uh, wasn't a trick. He kind of tricked it. Yeah. Tricky yeah. On this one. So then, um, yeah. So what do y'all talk about at home? Well, we used to talk about cases all the time, but mm. now we have two kids mm. um, who are like they're sponges absorbing everything. And so we've had to dial it down quite a bit. (laughs) Do you sell things? We do. But when it comes to work, usually we have to wait until after that. So we have a three and a five year old, both Uh. boys. um, And they'll just randomly repeat stuff that we say. (laughs) We're like, Oh gosh, there was so much B L O O D. (laughs) (laughs) Do they, do they know, do they know what you do? Um, They, they know that I look at bones um, although my three-year-old, I had, I was working on a, a report and I had a whole skeleton up on the computer screen. Mm-hmm. He was like, are those dinosaur bones? <laughs> so it's cute. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I think they're learning right. more and more. They're figuring it out. Yeah. You don't get them little bone toys instead of building blocks. So they can assemble their own skeleton at, at three and no, five. No, but that's <laughs> a good idea. I should do that. Um, but, and then like, sometimes they'll be like, are you a doctor? And I'm like, well, not yeah, a real no. doctor. <laughs> Absolutely. So they're they're asking questions and they hear us talking a little bit. But um, my husband will be on call and we're in the car and and he'll get a call for hanging. And I'm like, can you somehow talk in code? Because <laughs> they're 100 percent listening the oh. whole time. So <laughs> oh yeah, it's it makes interesting. It difficult. They're like, ooh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they know it got serious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. But fast forward five years and be like, oh, dad's got another hanging. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't Teacher that hears happen. that at school and they're like, uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what do you guys do for fun? Uh, we like to be outside, um, either on the boat or the beach mm-hmm. or um, 
releasing energy for these two children that we have mm-hmm. who are full of energy. Mm-hmm. So we're usually exhausted by the end of the day and they're still bouncing off the walls. So <laughs> is, and like, is that kind of how you, cause we, we talked a lot, we've, we've talked over several episodes with different folks about kind of that balance and trying to remove yourself from the kind of work you're doing. So just spend a time with your kids getting out like that's what Definitely. does it for you is there something that it's like, okay, now I've got to go do, you know, my thing or whatever it is that kind of helps you separate yourself. I mean, I don't know that being with them was relaxing. Right. <laughs> at this distracting. Stage. Anyway. Yeah, definitely yeah. distracting. Um, but they're fun. They're, you know, very inquisitive and um, little thing. Like my five-year-old, his favorite Christmas toy was um, like the, the grabbers, like that you would grab trash with. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He was so excited. Was it just a regular one or like a dinosaur head or shark No, head? just a regular one. Oh, okay. <laughs> He was asking for it for like weeks. Oh. And so I just, I bought like a $8 one on Amazon uh-huh. and he was so excited and to the point where he would tell everyone to put their, their wrapping paper on the floor and <laughs> he would pick them up. <laughs> yeah. So little stuff excites them. I feel like them. you can Aww. use this to your advantage somehow. You oh know. yeah. Go pick up your room, use your grabber or whatever. Mm-hmm. My husband, if I leave him home with them, he'll like walk them to the park and they'll both have their grabber and they pick up trash on the way. <laughs> so that's how they burn energy. That's awesome. Whatever it takes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Well, we appreciate you coming in and yeah, talking thank you to so us. Thank you for having me. I mean, we, I, I know that we'll probably get a lot of feedback on this episode because mm-hmm. people are just anything forensics, bones mm-hmm. and all that stuff. We'll, we, we can sit here and do, we can do five or six episodes just talking to Meredith, I'm sure. About the weeds uh, of of all this. Uh, There's about, some great about people the out there. Yeah. About the weeds. About yeah. the weeds. Yeah. Not the bones. Uh, the, bones <laughs> the bones that are in the weeds. Getting in the weeds. Exactly. Yeah. The getting in the weeds about, about bones. forensic anthropology. Mm-hmm. And now we know the difference between anthropology and pathology. And What's the difference, Ricky? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're spelled different. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we really appreciate you coming on, taking the time. This mm-hmm. is a, We do have a, a commemorative cup here that uh, is very exclusive Thank to people you. that have participated uh, on, on the podcast. And, um, you know, I think at some point we'll get back around to you if something new happens or something cool. Oh, yeah. sure. Maybe if we get our dual set up, we can get her and Chalmers in here at the same oh, time. Oh, that, that would be fun. That would be yeah. cool. Yeah. So just tell old, old war stories and have a good time. But anyway, we appreciate you uh, for coming in. And uh, Laura, if someone say what? We have, oh. we always ask one oh, yes. question of the guest read it before we end. Sorry, yeah. this is my first time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if there was something, and this, I'm actually really looking forward to answering this one. We always oh. try to suggest, you know, and, and ask, hey, if there's something that, that we could, you could share with the public to make your job easier, what would it be besides get dental work done? That would be my, <laughs> no. So, and we kind of touched on it earlier. Um, <laughs> since working here and getting to know intimately the crime scene process and latent print process. I think the most important thing is just to realize that stuff doesn't happen overnight. And while the sheriff gives us so much equipment um, and technology, the, the TV shows really demonstrate forensics in a different light. Um, so just to be aware of kind of the difference and the reality of it, um, especially going if you're a jury member, um, just keeping an open mind when it comes to um, the reality that we're faced with when it comes to um, we don't get DNA the next day or fingerprint identifications that same day. Mm-hmm. So it definitely takes time and takes expertise and training. Excellent. Dr. Meredith Tice, everybody. If people want to give us feedback or get in touch with us somehow, Laura, how would they go about doing we that? love to hear what people think about us. If they have any thoughts about this episode, any questions for Meredith, questions for us, thoughts about future guests we might want to have, they can contact us at Let's 56 at PCSONet.com. That's L E T S 56 at PCSONet.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks, everybody.